Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Matt, the vocals of Cryptopsy, and you're listening to my podcast, Vox and Hops, where I sit down with fellow metal musicians and we talk about their lives, music, and craft beer. Just in case you missed it, I am going to be hosting the one-year anniversary party for Vox and Hops on October 26th at Turbo House on St. Denis Street in Montreal. For this event, I'm super excited to announce that I will be doing the first live interview for Vox and Hops with a very special secret guest who I will be announcing next week during the intros of my podcast. So check that out next week. You don't want to miss that. I have also ordered the very first Vox and Hops branded glassware. It's a beautiful nine ounce tasting glass. It is exactly the style of glass that I use when I am at home drinking craft beer at my house. And it has a black Vox and Hops logo on it. I'm super excited to receive them so that I can start posting some pictures of what these suckers look like so you guys know what to expect. But what are you going to do with a glass in your hand all night you're wondering at a party? Well, I went and I did the very first collaborative brew alongside the great people of Micro Brasserie Le Fermentor from L'Assomption. And we brewed a delicious, hazy New England IPA that we called Highway to Hops. I'm super excited for the party October 26th at Turbo House in Montreal. You can get your tickets right now. And with your purchase of the ticket, you receive entrance to the party, the 9-ounce Vox and Hops branded tasting glass, and one free serving of Highway to Hops. All of that, the ticket links, all of the information is available on the Vox and Hops Facebook page, and everything is available in the description of this podcast. I hope that you guys had a great week. I had a great week. I was extremely busy. Sunday, I was at Bloodletting North America at Fofon Electric, and I did a bunch of interviews there. Super excited to get those out to you guys. And on Monday, I was invited out to the Warbringer Enforcer Show, also at Fofon Electric. And I was invited out there by a Vox and Hops alumni, the great Chris Sutsos of Jha Films' YouTube channel. He's an awesome dude. I had a great time hanging out with him. He invited me out, so I went and I hung out, and I conducted an interview that night as well. I'm super excited to get that out so that you guys can see what that's all about. Today on the podcast, I am with Andy Thomas, the guitarist of Black Crown Initiate. This is Vox and Hops, episode number 73. I warn you, what you are about to hear is very disturbing indeed. What's up, everybody? Today, I am at St. Buck, and I'm with Andy Thomas from Black Crown Initiate. Yes, you are. Finally. Yes. This is like, I don't know, 10 longer months in the making. It's been a while. Yeah. How are you, brother? It's been a long time. I'm really good. I'm uh, on tour here uh, in Montreal. We play at the Electric Booty tonight. Yes. Yeah. That's what that means, right? Yeah, that is that is exactly what that means. The Fofon Electric, the classic CBGBs of Montreal. Yeah. Yeah. It's been around forever, and so is the sound system. Nirvana played there, right? Uh, yes, Nirvana has played there, yes. Yes. It's cool. How has the tour been? How's it been going? How long have you been out? I We've been out for five days. It's been going good. Um, we did, what do we do? New Hampshire. Then we did Halifax, Moncton, uh, Quebec City, and tonight Montreal. It's been good so far. Everybody's really cool, which is cliche, right? But they really are. Everybody on the package is good, and we get along, and kick-ass bands so how involved were you with choosing the lineup well it's kind of interesting you should ask that because like originally the tour was supposed to be us Numenorian and uh which is I guess a band from Alberta it is yes they're, yes, very, yes. they're very good yes Sam uh, Yates from uh Ingested was telling me about them okay yeah so it was supposed to be us them and Warforged I'm not really sure what happened but they ended up having to drop off the tour and then we got uh, uh, Inferi and Vale of Noth and then Vale of Noth had to drop off the tour I think they had some drum issues finding a drummer or something so it's just a three band package but I, I kind of like it that way it's a some bit more concise have, yeah but some nights you end up with like 17 local bands and then we play at like 4am to like 5 people and no you gotta put your foot down when you're a headliner on that shit yeah I'm learning that stuff I'm, I'm new to that I'm not you know it's our first head well actually no we did a headliner of Canada in 2015 I think but we were a little baby band and then so much different. Alex Kendrick was there. Vox and Hops alumni, Mr. Alexander Kendrick. Huge shout out as always. Beautiful. Love you, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about your youth. You're growing up in your parents' house. What was the soundtrack to your youth? What did your parents listen to? Oh, man. I, I had a really good musical youth. I, I was actually just talking about this the other night. Um, my my dad is, like, very much, like, a music historian and, and guitar enthusiast. So, like, 
I was raised on like Hendrix and Sabbath and Finn Lizzy and uh, Santana, uh, John McLaughlin, you know, stuff like that. So like there was that, and then my mom was very much into like Genesis and Peter yeah. Gabriel and uh, so the progressive side of things. Yeah, well, my dad was too, but like I, the one, the thing that lasted the most, or the, the, the most lasting musical. Uh, influence that I got from my mother is definitely Peter Gabriel because I'm a huge Peter Gabriel fan. Same here. And um, uh, so I got, you know, I really, I as far as a, as far as a musical childhood, I had a really great one. Um, my dad has a huge record collection, still does to this day. Uh, and then as I got into heavy metal music on my own, because my dad's a guitar freak, it was like. He, he, he really got into it as well because, you know, metal is very guitar-driven music. Was he playing? My dad knew, like, six chords. Okay. He showed me okay. my first chords. Uh, and then I wanted to... I wanted to learn... I wanted to take guitar lessons, and he refused to get them for me, which I remember being really pissed. I was like, man, this is bullshit. I wish he had, still, but... I ended up being a little 12-year-old. Well, I guess I was, I was I was about 10. I had a little blonde kid with a bowl cut. And I had these neighbors because I lived in the ghetto in Reading, Pennsylvania. And um, I walked past this house when I was like 10 years old, and I heard these dudes inside playing. It was like Slayer and Metallica riffs. And I heard it, and I was like, holy shit. Like, I gotta, so I knocked on, on their door, and they ended up being these Colombian brothers. Their names were Diego and Jorge Herrera. And they were 16 and 18. They were actually uh, affiliated with some not-so-savory stuff as well. But, like, I just knocked on their door and said, hey, will you guys teach me how to play guitar? And they were like, sure. So they taught me, I mean, like, for whom the bell tolls and shit like that. And they gave me, I remember on the same day, they gave me Sepultura Arise, Ride the Lightning, and Rain of Blood. And I was just like... Okay. <laughs> cool. So I actually think they got deported. So I think they're probably back in Colombia now. Really? Yeah. Uh, but that's really how I... That's my musical childhood. It's kind of interesting. But, yeah. Started with, with cool stuff from my parents and then ended up learning guitar from some Colombian gangbangers. Oh. We were just delivered a what looks like a beautiful, beautiful beer. Yeah. We we actually there's a funny story about how we ended up here at Saint Buck, Le Saint Buck. We were actually down the street at Saint Sublon, and I was like, "What kind of beer do you want to drink?" And you were like, "I want an Imperial Stout." Yeah. And I was like, "Fucking right! No one ever wants to drink an Imperial Stout on the on the podcast with me." Uh, so I anytime. go inside, check out the menu. There's not one to be found. No. So we walked up the street, and here we are, Le Saint Buck, and they just delivered us the Nocturna Affogato. From a Mont Registre, it's a stout imperial, and they call it a dessert imperial stout. Mont Registre is a brewery on the south shore of Montreal, okay. and they normally deliver pretty solid stouts. Let's Cheers. try it out. What's the ABV on this puppy? I think it's 10%. All right, let's get it on. It's delicious, absolutely sweet. It's very sweet. It's good. Sweet, but still really bitter. Yeah, it's not like a, like some, some like dessert stouts are just... Like drinking a cake or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't yeah, really yeah. like that, but this is just good. Very nice, very nice. You could have you could have six or seven of these and really start a fire. <laughs> Are you a craft beer enthusiast? Um, that's a tough question to answer because I will. I'll sit around my you know my girlfriend and I we sit around a lot of times and just drink Miller Lite. But um, she very much is. She works at a brewery in outside of the, the Phoenix metro area in a place called Gilbert. It's called 12 West Brewery, and they make very, very good craft beer, um, all kinds of stuff. They actually make uh, Pilsner called Arizona, Arizona Pills that, like, wins competitions out oh, there. Oh, cool. I'm going to have to know so this. if you go out there, let me know, and I'll, you know, tell you where it is and shit. But so m my point with that is my girlfriend is a craft beer enthusiast, so she's very much into the whole thing. Uh, so I get exposed to a lot of stuff. I just kind of know what I like, and I know that I love Imperial Stouts. Like, that just sort of, I don't know. It's it's what appeals to me. I mean, I, I, the, fir the first one I think I ever had was, like, Old Rasputin. Yes, of course. Yes. And I was just like, shit, man. This, like, there's beers that taste like this. This is what I like. Uh, and it was weird because, like, my tastes have changed. Like I said earlier, I before the interview, I, was, I used to love IPAs and sours. And then 
I just didn't. And the taste of them, I don't know what happened. And I, I guess my, you know, my just my preferences or my palate changed or whatever. And I did. I didn't like. Uh, I didn't like them anymore. And and recently, actually, because I've again because of my girlfriend being such a craft beer drinker and an IPA lover, I kind of just started drinking more and more IPAs again to the point that I do like them. Uh, but sours I still can't get into. But yeah, I mean, I love Imperial Stouts. It's really de- very delicious. This yeah, one this is great. Yeah, yeah. This is, yeah. Do you remember your first beer? Well, I mean, when I was younger, I, you know, my dad would probably give me beer at Thanksgiving or something. But like, not, not anything of note. I think the first, I can answer it this way, the first craft beer that I remember having ever and really, because you know when you're when you're 14, you can drink old Milwaukee because that's all you can get from somebody who's willing to buy you beer. And you're really excited about yeah. it. Uh, yeah, it, it, So I remember the first one being uh, Sierra Nevada Torpedo, which I still love. Um, and I remember being like, "Oh, this is an old Milwaukee." <laughs> you know, <laughs> what is this flavor? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it you know it tastes it tastes like a pine tree or something. And yes, uh, yes. And that sort of got me into. But I mean, the first alcohol I ever drank was Jägermeister, and that's kind of a funny story because I was, I was I think I was like 13, which is not great to admit. Uh, but everyone who knows me knows I'm a I'm a troublemaker. Uh, <laughs> I, my friends and I would buy a bottle, or we would get his older brother to buy us a bottle of Jaeger, and we were doing, we figured out that we could each do seven shots out of the bottle. And we were taking seven shots each, and then the bottle was gone, and we'd be fucking hammered, right? Young kid. And then we figured out later on that the shot glass we were doing shots out of was a double shot glass. Oh, shit, so you're doing so 14 shots. So I started shots. drinking doing 14 shots of Jaeger. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh... Yeah, so I mean, I was set up for success at a very young age, <laughs> and that's what that's what brought me here today. My propensity for alcohol drinking. What came first, uh, singing or guitar playing? Absolutely, guitar playing. Really? Uh, yeah, I didn't start singing uh, until this band started. I never wanted to sing. I never knew I could. I still ha- I still don't know if I can. But but like, yeah, I st- yeah. I started for this band. You have the voice of an angel. Thank you. I you know. I'm definitely not the only one that has said it on the podcast as well. I, I heard you and Alex say it. I got all, I got all, oh, man. <laughs> These fucking guys. But no, I literally, I started singing for the band. And um, because the type of vocalist I like, um, or I prefer as far as like melodic vocals, isn't a particularly, I'm picky about it. Like I, I love Devin Townsend, right? But I don't really like operatic vocalists that much. Um, so I've always been sort of a fan of like Maynard from Tool or just, but also like, I, I think vocally, like my favorite stuff is maybe like folk music. I love Crosby, Stills and Nash and Young. Uh, I love Iron and Wine, which is more yeah, modern I stuff. Yeah, I like that too. That yeah. guy's a beautiful voice. But like... I sort of enjoy a, a more personal voice, I guess, than like, you know, like power metal singers. Not that I don't like power metal, I do some of it. But I just, it's, so, you know, James, our singer, he's, he's actually a very good, I mean, you know he's a great vocalist. He's good at everything, yeah. But yeah. he can, he has very good pitch and, and stuff like that. But just the character of his voice was not necessarily what I was going for at the beginning. Although we've discussed now maybe implementing more of that, because I think our new guitarist, Ethan, is a very good singer as well. So I think. We may try on the next Some album. Some three-part harmonies? Yeah, we, stuff like that. Oh, I, I that'd think, be sick. I think it would be good. I mean, it's, it's it depends on what we can do in the live situation, because I think at that point you want in-ears and stuff like that. But to, I started singing just out of necessity, and then I realized very quickly, on tour with Behemoth, I might add, that singing live is very difficult, especially when you're playing guitar. So I basically was like, fuck, I'm terrible at this, and I have to go back to the drawing board. So I ended up taking vocal lessons for a little while with, like, a Juilliard trained guy. He was, like, a Broadway singer and stuff in my hometown, and um, that helped quite a bit. And I think, like, what I got mostly from that was, like, just... uh, with a guitar, for example, you have reference points, right? You have like, well, you play you play it on this fret. If you don't do it, it's wrong. 
but with, with vocals, it's your body. Mm -hmm. So you have to identify how things are supposed to feel sort of by comparing them to other feelings that you get with your body. Maybe if you're taking a shit or whatever. That's a good example. It is, it is, for your for your uh, bass, for your bass. Yeah. But, so I, I, I started not knowing anything, and I guess I maybe know a little bit now, but it's still very difficult. And I, you know, I don't admittedly live the healthiest lifestyle. I smoke cigarettes, stuff like that. and I, A lot of singers do, so I don't see that really being... I think cigarettes, what they really do is in the long run, in the long term... I think they take a lot of the top end off of your voice, probably. A lot of that higher rate, mm -hmm. range mm -hmm. of your register, but... Breathing properly is, like, not something I excel at, I'm saying, uh, but you can do that if you smoke cigarettes. Really. But you're also playing guitar and thinking it's not easy. It's almost like a ballsy choice that you guys chose to include. I'm just stupid, man. I'm not ballsy. You know, it's like, I, <laughs> I, if I had to go back and do it again, I mean, I probably would have done the same thing, but... I, I did do, I, I bit off way more than I could chew at first. And honestly, five years in now, I'm just starting, starting to feel somewhat confident in what I'm doing. And It's almost as if you guys were ahead of the scene, because I feel like the whole tech death scene has really blossomed now with bands like Obscura, sure. Beyond Creation, yeah. uh, the New Rivers of Nile, which you yeah. are a guest on. Yeah. And you guys were doing all that shit way before, like with much more melody. I don't know where, where did that all come from. That comes from, I think, to tie it back, I mean, that comes from my my musical background as a kid because I I was always a metalhead. I'm still a metalhead, you know, but I, I always loved everything, and I never really differentiated between... Like, I was never... I don't know how to describe it. When I started the band, I really wanted to have a band that just could do whatever I wanted. And I remember with you, for example, when you did uh, Unspoken King. That's right. Yeah. Right? I remember the backlash you got. And I, and I'm, and I'm not kissing your ass. This is the honest truth. I remember thinking, this is good. Like, what? what's the fucking problem? Because I never had, the, that's the point I'm making. I never had that mentality of like, this has to be this way. I'm not that way in any thing in my life, let alone music. Like, this, there's one way to do it. So, okay, a band used a different type of vocals. Matter of fact, a more, like, if we're talking about technical music and the, like, people judging your music on the technicality of it, well, melodic vocals are way more difficult at doing them well. That's way more difficult than... than Just screaming. So yeah. you actually did something more difficult and got judged by a technical community based on, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, it, yeah. Doesn't, it doesn't fucking make sense. And it didn't make sense to me as a kid. So I think that's probably where it came from. That's super interesting. How hard was it back in the day to find tour packages because you were so different? Were you guys, like, thrown, because you had screaming, technical music, you guys get thrown on to yeah, brutal that. packages and then here you are up there singing like an angel <laughs> yeah <laughs> how did that work you know <laughs> you mentioned being on tour with behemoth you know yeah. I, I see it well, being the, very those different guys, now they have clean vocals yeah those guys were really really cool to us man and they didn't have to be because we were eating. I remember like when we went on tour with them <laughs> my first show with behemoth was I want to say my eighth live show ever holy shit right so I show up in Arizona where I now live at a sold out show at a venue that I now go to all the time but like and behemoth sound check and I'm this idiot who somehow ended up there and I'm like what the fuck is this right but they were really cool with us um, to answer your question though yeah it's difficult I remember reading a, an article years ago about System of a Down and how when they first came out, nobody knew how to market them. That's right. Because they were, they weren't white, they weren't black, you know, they weren't, they were playing all different kinds of music, they weren't doing, you know, and I think maybe we encounter, not to put ourselves on that level at all, but I think it's the same concept really and... You know, we, when you when you end up on tour with DSI and yeah, exactly, and you're singing, exactly. like people like I'm surprised I didn't get like beaten up or anything. But I mean, <laughs> actually, a funny story about Glenn Benton. Glenn Benton is a traditionally terrifying guy, right? <laughs> so like, I don't know what to think. Um, <laughs> but for whatever reason, he liked me. 
so he'd come up and watch me play every night on the side of the stage and I would sing and then he'd see me the next day and he'd go hey Perry Como how you doing <laughs> so he called me, Glenn Benton called me Perry Como because I sang that's too and I'm funny like, dude life is weird because I you know I have a titanium rod in my leg from a deicide mosh pit when I was younger really because, yeah my from my knee to my ankle it's all titanium I fractured my tibia I'm fibula. fucking believable and here you are on tour with yeah and deicide. then I was like you owe me a new leg he's like no I fucking don't you know I'm like alright cool whatever <laughs> <laughs> but he called me Perry Como. And I'm just like, man, I'm on tour with my heroes. And they, you know, I don't know it's very surreal. I've had a weird life. <laughs> <laughs> there are some congratulations in order. Mm. You guys just announced that you were signed to Century Media Records. Yeah, man. Cheers to that. Thank you very much. This beer's really good, by the way. I really, really like it, yeah. Uh, yeah, we did. You guys sort of had like a, a quiet moment. Yeah. You could call it a hiatus. You could call it a in-between... Was it an in-between? It was a period of complete uncertainty. Okay, and how did that feel for you? If you feel like... like I'll, talk, I'll talk all about it, man, because it's, it's, you know, so you what, can't... So what, what led up to that? Because you guys were, like, hot. You guys were right. That that last album you guys put out, I thought... Selves. I wrote you, and I was like, yeah. this is a top ten album of the year. Thank you, man. Yeah, you know, I think it was a kind of a perfect storm of shit, really. Uh, we went through a lot of label bullshit. Um... Who were you with before? We were I with E1. E1. Okay. And um, we entered into a management situation that we knew was less than savory. But at the time, that early in our career, it was sort of the only option that we had. to. It was like, you want to go on tour with Behemoth or not? Okay, what do we have to do? So we basically ended up in a management situation where when we had to fire our manager, who also owned the fucking tours that we were doing, uh, he refused to promote our album because he was also head of A&R at the label. Got it. Got it. So we fired a manager for not paying us for an entire tour. And then because he also had was head of A&R at the label or whatever, he basically buried selves. So that album that I did, and I, that was, I've never worked harder on anything in my life, although I won't be able to say that anymore. But at the time... Good, good. Um, at the time, I had never worked on anything harder in my life, and it just got buried... To the point that we did two tours on selves. We did North America with Neabla Viscaris, and we did Europe with Warner of Osiris and all that. And we had, we were sent, I want to say, 60 copies of that album the entire time, and we sold out of them in one night. Of course. So we never, we, did it, we weren't even able to get that album for ourselves to sell when it came out. Um, so there was that. I think we maybe spread ourselves too thin with the touring at first because we were taking like every tour you were with everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you know, so you had all the personal bullshit, people getting tired of each other, coupled with the fact that we're not able to do our jobs properly because the label's trying to bury us. And it just, you know, there was a lot of personal stuff going on in our lives, mine especially. And um, it, just, it just fell apart. And I think when things fall apart to that degree, uh, some people have that extra gear where they can just say, all right, everything's real, 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 real bad, and I'm going to do something about it. But the way I kind of just fell into a pit of despair. And uh, I, yeah, I, I'm just glad I survived. But I mean, I realized after about a year and a half, like, Nothing's happening because you're not doing anything. So it's like, okay, boo-hoo, boo-hoo for a little while. And then it's like, well, you can do this forever and probably just die. <laughs> or, you know, try to get something together. So I actually, Nick and I, our bass player. Is he here tonight? No. Aww. His job couldn't, didn't let him tour. I love him. He's a beer maniac, too. He loves too. beer, too, yeah. 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 Uh, he's, he's still in the band. It's just, we got to figure out the touring okay. thing. Um, but... He and I just started writing music, and we didn't even really know what for. And James was always a part of it. J I mean, James has never been a part of writing. But, but he was always like, when you guys oh, yeah, are James, ready, I'll be there. James has been so faithful to this band. So loyal, I should say. Um, James is one of the reasons I'm still here. Just having him going like, you know how he talks like, well, I just think you should just keep trying. You know? and I'm like, all right, I, all right, I will. Because you think I should, even if I don't think I should right now. And um, so, yeah, James is, yeah. He's, there were a couple times where he just came up to Reading to hang out with me. and you know, to, to, keep, to keep you going. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
so we ended up just writing like an album's worth of music. More now because Ethan is writing as well, because he's an old guitar student of mine who got drastically better than me very quickly. He's the only student I ever had where I was like, dude, I, I, I got nothing else for you. We're done. Yeah. You know everything that I know and more. So he's writing. We, and we just ended up with a shit ton of music, man. And I didn't know what it was for. but And the cool thing about it is because there was so much time between the last one and this one, it's different again. Mm-hmm. And I like that. Mm-hmm. Which, going back to, you know, The Unspoken King or whatever, when bands change, I like that. because The like, evolution. You're growing. I as a person, or you should be, you should be trying to. So why wouldn't your music do the same thing? But, but were you always writing it for Black Crown Initiate, or I it didn't could know. have been a new project? We had no label, we had no management, okay. we had no booking agent, we had nothing. Though. I didn't know anybody cared. At least the label, you weren't like shelved, and you could didn't have to change the name. You know what I mean? Thankfully. Well, yeah. they they in the end we ended up saying, hey, are you gonna keep working with us or what? And they said, no, not at all, no way. So, okay, good, thank you. Which is now good. we can move on. Century t- was interested, and that's great. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Mike can we expect to hear some new music? Are you playing new music playing now? Playing a new song tonight. Are you? And you can hear me struggle vocally very, very awesome. Yeah. Top of my range, and I struggle with uh, where I have to go into falsetto, Ooh. and wh- and how to make that smooth. And I still think I'm failing miserably, but the band's making me do it every night because it's a banger. Yeah, it is. It is awesome. So it's, it's, what, uh, what can fans expect? Where you say it's different, and what aspect? I think there's going to be like. A lot more. I think it's a lot. The song we'll play tonight was one of the earlier ones that we wrote, and I think that has almost a simpler vibe. But the, some of the stuff that we've written at, towards the end is, is definitely the most complex stuff we've ever written, but not like in a speed way or anything. I mean, the three of us have been writing, Ethan, Nick, and I have been writing music together since before the band started, so. Our sensibilities. I mean, it's kind of weird because we asked Ethan to be in the band before Rick, who I also grew up playing music with. So the chemistry that I have with Ethan is very similar to the one I had with Rick. Um, but I think, I guess a lot of the death metal influence is go- kind of gone. Okay. I, you, just, I just you, whittle, you whittle it away. Yeah, because I just, I mean, I, I mean, it's still there a little, but I vocally it will always be there because I enjoy that type of vocal as a dynamic tool. Mm-hmm. Ba- the, yeah. the brutalness yeah. balanced with your... Yeah, and, and, and when you can make things really huge with that type of vocal. Even though the music's breathing. Right. Yeah. And um, so that will always be... But I think... I don't know. I just care so little about that anymore. What and other I, people think? Yeah. It's not bad. Like I love bands that do that. You know what I mean? So I'm not like I don't mean that to be a prick. Where I'm like, oh, you, I don't care. You know? I, I just for <laughs> me, I, I don't care. You know? So I think. Yeah, it's tough for me to say. There's a lot of music too, though. So that's the thing. There's a lot. Do you of know? Music. Do you know where that you have so much music that it's going to be more than an album? We have more than an album's worth of music. Okay. Right so sure. now you're in that. Picking yeah. what's gonna fit on this album yeah, for sure, yeah. and I mean we've there's all kinds of stuff like we have our first song that we've written ever on six string guitars, shit like that. It's because I was playing in tombs for a little while, just filling. That's up for correct. Them. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah, and I ended up with a couple of six strings and drop C tuning, which I've never really played in. So it opens up a different creative right, world right. there. Yeah. yeah. So it's just all kinds of shit. That's interesting. Um, and yeah. there's, you know, I, I think also if I had to describe it like. In the past, we've had songs that were very different from each other. I think the songwriting is just as co- cohesive, if you think our songwriting is cohesive. But I think the new songs contain more elements within one song. Awesome, they awesome. Before, you know? So I, I, tough to say, though. Closer to that Peter Gabriel. I love Peter Gabriel, man. <laughs> I can talk about Peter Gabriel forever, man. It's more progressive, almost. Oh, dude. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it is. It is. Yeah. It is. I mean, and uh, Ethan, you'll hear Ethan play tonight. That kid's a virtuoso. Huh? So, I mean, he's... He, I, I, He's an incredible musician. I mean, you give you give the kid a, a shoelace and he'll make. You, you tend to gather incredible musicians. I do. I'm not yeah. sure why. You know, Wes Haunch was in your band, mm-hmm. which is 
<laughs> you know, one of the, he's one of the best guitar players out there. Yeah, yeah, so, absolutely. solid, solid absolutely. guitar player, incredible yeah. guitar yeah. player. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, and that's another thing. As you grow older, I, I tend to be a very self-deprecating individual. Um, but you have to kind of, if you, and I'm, I, I, this is something, uh, it's sort of a personal venture in my life in general lately. It's like, well, maybe you don't believe in yourself all the time, but if you step outside of all that and look at the people who do believe in you, you're still accountable, even when you don't want to be. So that's a that's a definite switch, and I, and that like that goes from bands to relationships, mm -hmm, all mm -hmm. kinds of shit. Like there will be times where you don't believe in yourself, but back to the hiatus or whatever it was. I'll never let myself go to that. That dark, that dark corner again. Well, I, yeah. It's not necessary. No. It was necessary then. But look but how much you've grown because of it. Exactly. And I look where I am in my life now, and it's it's exactly where I want to be. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's beautiful. It really is. Yes, I, I think about it every day, like how lucky I am to be where I am right now, because it could have gone the other way. I'm glad it didn't. Me too. Andy, me too. thank you for being here. Fuck yeah. Hanging out with me. <laughs> drinking a good beer. Fuck yeah. Cheers to Black Crown Initiate. And, and Cryptopsy. You, thank you. And you being on, back on track. Cheers, Fuck brother. Fuck yeah. Here's to you. Hey, thank you all so much for listening right to the end. You know that I love and appreciate that. Andy, such such a cool dude. I, I seriously really, really, really like this dude. And I finished time my night. I went back to the show. I watched him play, and by the end of the night, I was like, I'm going to do a side project with Andy Thomas. So, uh, Andy, uh, I, I really want to do that. Uh, let's make it happen. I love you, dude. You're a sick guitar player, and you have that beautiful, angelic voice. I'm super excited uh, to see what the new Black Crown Initiate is going to put out. I've included in the description of this podcast the new single, which they just dropped, which will be coming out on their release that is coming out on Century Media Records, as we spoke about during this interview. Cheers to uh, Black Crown Initiate and to Andy Thomas. As I mentioned last week, in case you missed it, I have added a donate button to thevoxandhops.com. That's www.voxandhops.com. There is a little tab at the top where you can click donate. And if you feel like you would like to contribute something to the podcast financially, it doesn't have to be big. Anything is appreciated. I don't do this podcast to make any money. That is not why I do it. I do it to uh, connect with metal musicians and to share delicious craft beers with them and then sharing all those conversations and little tidbits with all of you. That is the main reason I do the podcast. But anything financial always helps me cover my back end and uh, helps me purchase the beers that I'm sharing with my guests. So anything is appreciated. I hope you have a great weekend. Remember to enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. Cheers, Vox and Hopsets. Oh,